Welcome to a fascinating journey into one of the most enigmatic aspects of the Great Pyramid, the Queen's Chamber Shafts. These narrow passageways, hidden within the heart of this ancient wonder, have puzzled researchers for centuries. In this video, we'll delve deep into the secrets of these mysterious shafts, exploring their design, purpose, and the remarkable discoveries made by early explorers and modern robotic missions. The Queen's Chamber shafts, much like their counterparts in the King's Chamber, have long been shrouded in mystery. They were discovered in 1872 by Dixon, but their precise purpose remains a subject of debate. What sets them apart is their deliberate concealment behind stone blocks integrated into the chamber's walls, raising questions about the builder's intentions. In this video, we'll explore the intricate details of these shafts, from their dimensions to their concealed entrances and the possible reasons behind this unique construction choice. We'll also discuss the artifacts found within the shafts, including the intriguing Dixon relics and their potential implications for the pyramid's dating. The exploration of these shafts has been a challenging endeavor, from early explorers using rods to the more recent robotic missions led by Ganton Brink and the National Geographic team. These missions have uncovered some remarkable features, including copper fittings, scratches on the walls, and the ceiling stone at the end of the shaft, shedding light on the purpose and construction techniques employed by the ancient Egyptians. We'll also discuss the various theories surrounding these shafts, from their role in ventilation to their potential use in ancient rituals or astronomical alignments. We'll touch on the geometric and symmetrical considerations suggested by researchers and the ongoing debates about their exact length. Join us on this captivating journey as we delve into the mysteries of the Queen's Chamber shafts in the Great Pyramid of Giza, and together, we'll explore the ancient secrets that continue to perplex and intrigue us. The Queen's Chamber contains two shafts that were discovered by Dixon in 1872. These shafts, like those found in the King's Chamber, are sometimes referred to as air shafts or star shafts. However, their precise purpose remains largely unknown. Unlike the shafts in the King's Chamber, which are open and extend through the chamber's walls, the shafts in the Queen's Chamber have their entrances deliberately concealed by stone blocks that are integrated into the wall masonry. It's crucial to emphasize that the shaft entrances are concealed behind these built-in stone blocks, and they are not merely covered by stone patches. This image above depicts the partially exposed shaft in the north wall, while the opening in the south wall is more open and regular. In the north shaft, the masons had a relatively easier time creating the shaft within the wall block, as two sides of the shaft aligned with the joint lines, making it more straightforward. On the other hand, the southern shaft is essentially a trough cut into the wall stone, with only the upper side aligning with a joint. The dimensions of the shafts are quite similar to those found in the king's chamber. According to Petrie, the north shaft is about 8.6 inches high and approximately 8 inches wide, equivalent to about 21.8 by 20.3 centimeters, while the south shaft measures around 8.8 .8 inches in height. Both shafts extend a certain distance horizontally within the wall before making an upward turn. The north shaft runs for about 76 inches, equivalent to 1.93 meters, before it ascends, while the south shaft extends for approximately 80 inches, around 2.03 meters, before its upward turn. To conceal these shafts, a portion of the wall block, approximately 5 inches wide, was left in place. If we were to remove the masonry blocks from the wall, we would find something similar to this image. The intentional placement of these stone stocks on the front face of the wall blocks raises intriguing questions about their purpose. Why were these shafts concealed behind these stocks of stone? Was it always part of the plan to keep them hidden? Could it have served as a contingency plan in case the king's burial occurred prematurely and the upper chamber wasn't fully completed? Concealing the shafts behind these stocks may have allowed for the option to cut through them later to fulfill their intended function, whatever that may have been. One might also wonder why the shafts were not initially left open in the chamber. After all, the shafts terminate well above the ceiling of the king's chamber. Leaving them open could have assisted in ventilating the chamber for the workers, and it would have offered a means to retrieve items that accidentally fell into the shaft, such as tools or debris. If the intention was to seal the shafts, a close-fitting stone patch could have been used instead. These questions regarding the purpose and design of the shafts continue to perplex researchers. When Dixon accessed the shafts, 
he discovered several artifacts, although the exact circumstances and locations where these items were found are not entirely clear. Nevertheless, a drawing illustrating these artifacts was featured in Harper's Weekly on January 11, 1873. Zahi Hawass explained that the artifacts found in the shafts of the Queen's Chamber consisted of a small dolerite ball, a copper hook, and a fragment of cedar wood. Where he said, We are still uncertain as to what specifically Dixon found inside these air shafts. We do know, however, that he unearthed a copper implement often described as a hook. It was located at the bottom of the southern shaft's entrance, QCS, among much debris. Dixon also pulled out a wooden shaft and a granite ball, often described as a sculpture's tool, from the bottom of the northern shaft, QCN, where he found it hidden amongst a small amount of debris. These three items are often referred to as the Dixon relics. The most interesting relic for some was the wooden fragment, due to the fact that this could be carbon dated. This wooden fragment was only rediscovered by Abir Eladani in an Aberdeen University in 2019 and subsequent carbon dating of the wood suggested that it was some five centuries earlier than the supposed dating of Khufu's pyramid. This in itself is not so unusual, as other carbon dating studies in Egypt have produced similar results. This is often explained as wood from the center of a long-lived tree, or recycled wood, and so on. Carbon dating often has a large plus or minus date range, and to this, we can add the uncertainties of Egyptian chronology itself with the current best estimate that Khufu ascended the throne around 2590 BC. Given the uncertainties in carbon dating and Egyptian chronology, should the dates really surprise us in an era some 4500 years ago? The wood being found in a sealed shaft is clearly contemporary to the construction of the pyramid, and this is why so much interest has been shown in the past to finding the relic so it could be dated. Now that it has been dated, it will come as a disappointment to those who see the pyramid as a much older structure from some lost civilization. The early explorers had limited methods to investigate these shafts, mainly using rods to probe the shafts and determine their dimensions. In the northern shaft, explorers encountered challenges due to its complex and winding path, designed to navigate around the masonry structure of the Grand Gallery. As a result, some of the rods used by early explorers still remain stuck in the shaft, demonstrating the difficulty they faced in pushing them through the shaft's bends. In contrast, the southern shaft follows a relatively straight path, making it easier to navigate and investigate. Between 1992 and 1993, the UPUO project led by Rudolf Gantenbrink used a small robotic rover to explore the shafts in the Great Pyramid. However, this rover could only investigate the lower part of the complex north shaft. The remaining portion of this intricate shaft couldn't be explored until 2002 when a new team from National Geographic, equipped with their own pyramid rover, finally managed to reach the end of the shafts. Our most comprehensive understanding of the shafts and how they were constructed is based on Rudolf Gantenbrink's work. He established a website where he shared a wealth of information about his findings, including detailed computer-aided design CAD, drawings. Unfortunately, Gantenbrink's website is no longer accessible. The most significant find by Gantenbrink's rover was at the terminus of the southern shaft. There, the rover encountered a high-quality limestone block with copper attachments that sealed off the end of the shaft. A similar stone with fittings was also discovered at the end of the northern shaft in 2002 by the National Geographic team. From Gantenbrink's website, we can examine the terminus of the southern shaft and the associated copper fittings, which appear somewhat corroded. A piece of one of these fittings had dislodged and was found on the floor, reportedly situated near block number 27. In 2002, the National Geographic team, employing their pyramid rover, drilled a hole through the closure stone at the end of this shaft. However, what they discovered was merely a small void beyond it and the backside of what appears to be a core limestone block. The stone at the termination of the shaft, as noted by Gantenbrink, displayed an exceptionally fine finish. The construction of this inclined shaft has an inverted arrangement compared to the horizontal portion penetrating the wall block. In this case, the ceiling and walls of the small shaft were carved from a single block of masonry, resting on top of a limestone block that served as the pavement. Block number 28 stands adjacent to the closure stone, and Gantenbrink provides further insights. 
Block number 28 is extremely well crafted, smoothly polished and consists of a lighter colored material than that of the other blocks. In some spots, including the ceiling just before the mysterious closure stone, very fine, dark gray veins are visible in the stone. Evidence of the material's high degree of homogeneity. He stated as well, in our video inspection of all four shafts so far, a total of about 180 meters, we have seen only blocks made of local limestone. But the final block before the slab is definitely carved from lighter colored limestone, probably originating from the Mokata Mountains about 30 kilometers from the Giza Plateau, on the other side of the Nile. This was the material the builders used for the higher quality casing stones of the pyramid's exterior, and for the chamber systems. The workmanship of the last block in front of the slab is also much higher than anything we have seen in any of the shafts so far. This image offers a closer look at Gantenbrink's CAD file detailing the initial section of the southern shaft, which primarily consists of type A blocks. In this segment of the shaft, we can observe several noteworthy features. Block 3 shows signs of settling, likely a result of the pressure exerted by the ceiling beams. Blocks 7 and 8, as depicted in the image on the left, were intentionally left with a very rough finish. Of particular interest, Gantenbrink made an observation regarding the first three joints within the shaft, noting that they exhibit a vertical alignment. This feature raises questions about the construction technique employed and the intentional design choices made during the building process. These observations and notations help us gain a deeper understanding of the pyramid's construction, including the challenges faced by the builders, the deliberate roughness of certain blocks, and the vertical alignment of specific joints in the southern shaft. To deflect the pressure of the roof beams into the horizontal plane. On the rough block 8 he stated, block number 8 has an unusually irregular surface. This riddle is solved by block number 9, one wall and the ceiling of which are rough. But the western wall is relatively smooth and shows signs of having been worked with a chipping chisel. Apparently, the ancient Egyptian builders first initially shaped the shaft blocks with a pointed chisel, which explains the uneven surface, and then dressed them with a chipping chisel. Blocks number 8 and 9 were evidently built into the structure in unfinished form. In 1992 we also found three unfinished blocks in the upper shafts. In the upper part of the southern shaft, highlighted, we come across what appears to be a lateral displacement in some of the shaft blocks, shown left. Here we can see a red mason's line on the corner of the block. Gantenbrink have stated, This sudden deviation in the position of some blocks indicates that in some cases, the blocks were laterally moved while the upright blocks remained unaffected. The reason for this is not clear. Was it an attempt to compensate for those blocks that were out of alignment? Or was it an experimental procedure due to a feeling that some blocks might pose an issue in tunnel execution? This lateral deviation in the southern shaft raises questions about the procedures followed in the design of the pyramid and the construction process, and it may represent variations in the execution of the structure or the engineering feasibility of those specific blocks in the southern shaft. He stated, blocks number 16 and 17 are offset by about 3 to 4 centimeters. It is impossible to determine with any certainty whether this deviation occurred during original construction or at a later date. This spot lies just under the floor level of the king's chamber, where Petrie discovered unusual settling. It is possible that this settling, and the observed deviations were caused by an earthquake during the pyramid's construction. In this drawing, it's labeled some of the blocks and highlighted blocks 19 to 26. Gantenbrink made the following observation. From block number 19 onwards, we detected strange scratches on the walls of the shaft, extending all the way up to block number 26. Depending on the surface texture of the walls, these scratches appear with varying clarity, at a consistent height of 2 to 3 centimeters above the shaft floor. The scratches are not very deep and are visible only because they penetrate the stone's patina. Since the scratches extend over the block joints, it is obvious that they were made after this shaft sequence was finished. It would appear that something was dragged up through the shaft subsequent to its completion. Here, we can see some of these faint scratches located just above the floor level. This discovery raises questions about what may have been dragged or transported through the shaft after its initial construction. In this image captured by Gantenbrink, you can observe the scratches on both walls of the shaft and something adhering to the west wall. 
Gantinbrink points out, shortly after the joint leading to block number 21, a bit of light-colored mortar, most likely gypsum, adhering to the west wall of the shaft gives the impression that here, something was originally attached to the wall. These faint scratches appear consistently about 2 to 3 centimeters above the shaft floor. They are not very deep and are only visible because they penetrate the stone's patina. Since these scratches extend across block joints, it is clear that they were made after the shaft sequence was completed. It seems that something was dragged up through the shaft after its construction. Gantinbrink made a similar discovery further up the shaft at block number 26, finding an impression on the west wall of the shaft at the beginning of the block. Just like block number 21, there was also an impression in this area, hinting that something might have been attached to the wall. The damaged floor in this vicinity is also noteworthy. Gantinbrink proposed a plausible explanation for the presence of mortar traces on the west wall. He suggested that this mortar might have been used as a temporary adhesive to attach strings to the shaft's wall. These strings could have served various purposes, including measurement and monitoring. Later, when these strings were removed, the mortar could have broken away, leaving behind the impressions that we now observe on the shaft walls. This could indicate that the ancient builders used strings as measuring cords to keep track of the shaft's dimensions. As shown in this image by Gantinbrink, there is noticeable damage to the floor, which posed a significant obstacle for his robot. He explained that. At the beginning of block number 26, a large section of the floor has broken away. This is the worst damage we observed anywhere in the shaft sequences so far investigated. At this point, however, the pressure on the shaft amounts to only one-third of the maximum value. Near the Queen's Chamber, 115 meters of pyramid material pressed downward on the shaft. But only 35 meters of material pressed down on this spot, where we observe the greatest shaft damage. This highly unusual finding can have resulted only from one of two possible causes. One extremely inept construction work below block number 25 and 26. It must be remembered, however, that it is this final section of the shaft which otherwise displays the highest quality workmanship observed anywhere in the shaft system. 2. The existence of an as yet undiscovered structure below or above this shaft section. Such a structure could produce a pressure peak, which could in turn focus considerable additional force on the shaft and possibly cause the observed damage. In this image, we can observe a distinct groove cut into the floor of the shaft. According to Gantinbrink, this long cutting groove can be seen at block number 26, and there are more grooves at blocks number 27 and 28. These grooves were a result of the construction process aimed at creating precise joints. During construction, two blocks, which had been initially shaped with chipping chisels, were pushed together. Then, a saw was used to cut material from both block ends in the gap between them. This method resulted in a precise joint between the two adjoining blocks and left behind a cutting groove on the block underneath. The existence of such grooves suggests that these blocks were initially used as a base for cutting precise joints. This raises an important question. What were the precise joints intended for? The shaft blocks themselves were dressed primarily with chisels. This was evident from various parts of the shaft blocks, including the lower sides and exposed edges due to block displacement. At the upper outlet of the southern shaft, both outer sides of the blocks were also shaped using chisels. Therefore, it is reasonable to assume that the shafts were constructed without the use of sawing. Casing stones closer to the pyramid, just 19 meters away from this location in the shaft, were cut in their final position. This is evident from the cutting grooves on the stones directly beneath the casing stones. The corridor and chamber system within the pyramid, which also features precise cut joints, had been completed long before this shaft construction level was reached. In summary, these findings suggest the possibility of an, as yet undiscovered, structure in the upper region of the Southern Queen's Chamber shaft for which these precision joints were created. Here image presented by Gantinbrink, there are two circular patches that appear to be lighter in color. On his website, specifically in the section about the 1993 campaign, there's a discussion about the possibility that these patches might have been seals. Gantinbrink raises the question and speculates about their purpose and stated, about the seals, Professor Stadelman is quite adamant. He says no such round seals were ever used in the Old Kingdom. But much later, together with a German Egyptologist, 
I was to investigate this issue more thoroughly and discover that this is not necessarily true. The National Geographic report suggested that two white areas appear on the stone face centered under both of the metal pins. The white areas may be from natural erosion of the block or may be attributed to a blow from the tool that could have been used to flatten the metal pins to the face of the stone. According to Gantenbrink, the stone that closes the shaft is not attached with mortar, and it seems to be slightly larger in width and height than the shaft, with only the bottom edge visible. The hole drilled through this stone by the National Geographic team revealed that it's a thin slab, approximately 2 inches thick, with a gap of around 7 inches to the next block. In 2010, the DJD rover successfully inserted a flexible camera through this hole and made additional discoveries. And here we can see that the copper fittings form a sort of loop. The DJD rover also made additional discoveries, including some mason's marks and what appeared to be hieratic numerals. Researcher Luca Miatello suggested that these markings represent the number 121, with the rightmost mark denoting 100, the middle one representing 20, and the leftmost marking indicating 1. This interpretation could imply that the shaft's length was 121 cubits, an unusual figure. However, there is some uncertainty regarding the actual length of the shaft. Gantinbrink's CAD files suggested a length of approximately 59.4 meters, which was considered too short. The National Geographic team stated that the step in the floor was approximately 185 feet or 56.4 meters. Nevertheless, Gantinbrink's records indicated this step as 53 meters, creating a significant discrepancy. In a further development, Zahi Hawass recalculated the position of the step to be approximately 57 meters, 187 feet, inside the southern shaft, with a height of 5 centimeters, 2 inches. This highlights the varying measurements and interpretations related to the shaft's dimensions. The variation in measurements has led to uncertainty about the exact length of the shafts. Gantinbrink's CAD drawing suggests a distance of about 6.4 meters from the step to the closure stone. When this figure is combined with the new measurement given by Hawass, it results in a total length of 63.4 meters or 121 cubits of 52.4 centimeters, 20.63 inches, each. In their latest book, Lenner and Hawass commented on the findings of the National Geographic Pyramid Rover. They noted that the two blocking slabs with copper pins appear to be at a similar distance from the Queen's Chamber, around 65 meters, 213 feet, in both the northern and southern shafts. However, Gantinbrink had previously measured the distance of the southern shaft as approximately 59.5 meters, about 195 feet. Unfortunately, data from the two other rover teams is not as detailed as Gantinbrink's, making it challenging to definitively determine the length of these shafts. Therefore, the possibility of 121 cubits, as suggested by Miatello, remains plausible. Morton Edgar, who was given permission to clear the debris from the shafts in 1928, reported an interesting discovery that might corroborate the idea of a longer shaft. At that time, some Egyptologists believed that the Queen's chamber shafts were only dummies and extended only a few feet into the pyramid. To investigate, Edgar ordered several long steel rods threaded together and pushed them up the southern shaft. However, the rods hit an obstruction at approximately 208 feet, or 63.4 meters. He attempted this exercise twice, but both times he could not go beyond the 208-foot mark. This 208-foot obstruction aligns with the distance of the closure stone in the shaft. The scratches and damage observed by Gantenbrink might have been caused by Edgar's steel rods as he attempted to push them through the passage. The choice of 121 cubits for the shaft's length, although an unusual number, may relate to pyramid geometry. John Legan, in his article, The Geometry of the Air Shafts, suggests that this length could be associated with specific mathematical principles or ratios used in pyramid construction. This information raises questions about the actual length of the shafts, with different measurements provided by various explorers and researchers. The exact length of the shafts remains uncertain, but the 121 cubits proposed by Luca Miatello and the findings by Morton Edgar hint at the possibility of a longer passage than previously believed, and he stated, the north and south shafts from the king's chamber are now reported by Gantinbrink to have both opened in the casing at the same height of 80.63 milliseconds plus or minus 4 centimeters above the base. 
They thus coincided with the level of the 105th course as determined by Petrie. 3174.7 to 3176.0 inches above the base, mean 80.65 milliseconds. This is exactly 2 times 7 times 11 equals 154 cubits above the base. The level of the outlets was therefore commensurate with both the shaft profile of 7 rise on 11 base, and the casing profile of 14 rise on 11 base, placing the outlets at a distance of 154 by 11 fourteenths or 121 cubits horizontally inside the north and south base lines of the pyramid. Given the side length of the base of 440 cubits, the horizontal distance across the Great Pyramid at the level of the outlets was 442 x 121 or 198 cubits, and hence was exactly equal to the height of the pyramid from the floor level of the king's chamber to the apex, of 2882 cubits or 198 cubits. I apologize for not delving into the various design theories of the pyramid, as discussing them in detail would require a lengthy presentation. However, based on the inconsistent data available about the pyramid, I tend to lean towards agreeing with the statement made by Legan. He suggests that the design of these shafts was primarily influenced by geometric and symmetrical considerations, aiming for a coherent dimensional design. This design choice may not be directly related to the speculated astronomical alignments. The theory of air shafts or ventilation systems for the Queen's Chamber doesn't hold up, as these shafts are intentionally sealed at both ends. However, there is a disagreement regarding how the shafts were sealed at the chamber's end. Romer suggests that prior to their discovery in the 1870s, the ends of these small shafts seem to have been sealed with small stone slabs set flush against the wall surface. In a footnote to this statement, he suggests that practical considerations of stone cutting make it more likely that square holes were sealed with well-made, flickstein, which had become invisible due to soot and salt deposits on the chamber walls. There seems to be a discrepancy in the sources and interpretations of how the shafts were sealed at the chamber's end. Hawass's later update to Petrie's work doesn't clarify the situation regarding the use of flickstein or patch stones, with the main note being that soot and salt deposits were removed from the walls. Regarding Petrie's somewhat unclear statement, he essentially describes that these shafts look similar to the air channels in the king's chamber but their openings in the chamber wall were sealed with a stone plate that was left uncut. Other explorers have also weighed in on this matter, and it seems that there is no consensus on the use of patch stones. For instance, the Edgars argue that the builders intentionally left the last five inches uncut, and the absence of jointing indicates that these openings were not meant to be sealed. The debate over the sealing of the Queen's chamber shafts in the Great Pyramid highlights the ongoing uncertainty and lack of comprehensive data surrounding this ancient structure. With different experts presenting varying interpretations and accounts of how these shafts were sealed, it reflects the broader challenge of understanding the pyramid's intricate details. The lack of definitive evidence and the need for such questions to persist in the modern era underscore the limitations of our knowledge about this remarkable monument. In essence, it emphasizes the ongoing mysteries and ambiguities that shroud the Great Pyramid. This image provides a close-up view of the opening of the North Shaft. This particular shaft has not been fully explored. It's worth noting that this image was captured after the removal of salt deposits and soot. The precise details of how Dixon initially came across these shafts remain somewhat unclear. However, according to Piazzi Smith, who corresponded with Dixon, the discovery began with the observation of a crack in the south wall of the Queen's Chamber. This crack allowed Dixon, with the help of a wire extended to a considerable length, to explore the space behind the wall. Following this discovery, Mr. W. Dixon instructed his carpenter, a man named Bill Grundy, to create an opening in the wall using a hammer and steel chisel. This description aligns with the account from a Nature article in 1872, which mentions Dixon's ability to insert a wire through the joints. It's worth noting that the Queen's chamber walls exhibited various cracks, particularly in the south wall, with some of these cracks leading to the shafts. Piazzi Smith also asserted that the shafts were not sealed with patch stones, though he had not personally observed them, as they were discovered long after his visit. This image shows visible cracks in the south wall leading to the shaft. It's possible that these cracks caught the attention and allowed the wire to be inserted. Indeed, these fractures seem significant enough to permit airflow. 
The sides of the channel were found to be blackened with smoke, like the walls of the queen's chamber, and it was thought that a slight draft was perceptible. This suggests that these cracks played a role in allowing air or pollution to enter the shaft. When the northern shaft was opened, it's described, with the stone surface appearing as if it was freshly cut, and the cement joints being perfectly white. So, it seems the condition of the cracks and the wall surface played a role in the differences in the state of the shafts upon their discovery. The northern shaft presents a unique challenge to robotic rovers due to its twists and turns, which were designed to circumvent the structure of the Grand Gallery. The purpose behind these intricate shafts remains a mystery. For instance, one might wonder why the shafts weren't simply placed at the west end of the chamber, allowing for a more straightforward route. One could argue that the chamber and the beginning of the shaft were already under construction before the Grand Gallery's design was finalized. In this scenario, they would have had to adapt the shaft's path to avoid the Grand Gallery. However, this explanation appears unsatisfactory, as the northern shaft in the King's Chamber also had to bend around the masonry of the Grand Gallery. Ideally, one would assume that the design of the Grand Gallery was established before the construction of the King's Chamber, given that the Grand Gallery is the necessary access route to the King's Chamber. The reasons behind the choice of these shaft locations and their intricate paths remain an enigma. In the plan view of the Queen's Chamber and King's Chamber shafts from Gantenbrink's CAD files, the locations of the shafts are highlighted. Gantenbrink's robot could only reach a certain point in the Queen's Chamber north shaft, marked by a question mark. The northern shafts in both the Queen's and King's Chambers have several bends and turns that could have been avoided by placing them further west. This raises questions about why the shafts were designed this way. It's often mentioned that the shafts from both chambers are on the same vertical plane, but in reality, the King's Chamber shafts are slightly to the east of the Queen's Chamber shafts. Even in the small Queen's Chamber, where it's claimed that the shafts are perfectly opposite each other, there are slight discrepancies. Data regarding the exact locations of the Queen's Chamber shafts is limited, with some information available from various sources like Marajolio and Rinaldi's and Dormion's drawings. This plan of the Queen's Chamber, provided by Marajolio and Rinaldi, clearly shows that the shafts are not perfectly aligned. A red line drawn from one shaft to the other reveals that each shaft is slightly off-center to either side of this line. The line itself, located approximately 2.88 meters from the eastern wall of the chamber, corresponds to 5.5 cubits or half the length of the chamber, which measures 11 cubits in total. This line effectively serves as the north-south meridian of the chamber, with the north shaft lying to the east of it and the south shaft to the west. This discrepancy in the placement of the shafts appears intentional and should be considered when exploring the purpose of these shafts. Regarding the King's Chamber shafts, Piazzi Smith provides measurements for the well-preserved north shaft opening, indicating a range of 98.3 to 106.6 inches. This establishes a shaft axis of approximately 102.5 inches or roughly 5 cubits, positioning the center of the shaft at one quarter of the chamber's length, which is equivalent to 20 cubits. The view of the north shaft shown here is derived from Gantenbrink's CAD files. It illustrates the furthest point his robot could reach before encountering a bend in the shaft. This bend prevented further progress. The dashed lines at the end of the shaft correspond to the floor of the Grand Gallery. The arrangement of the masonry in this north shaft resembles what we observed in the southern shaft. However, there is a new block type, denoted as C. These blocks have a small portion cut out from the floor block. The initial horizontal portion of the shaft is measured at 1.93 meters. Gantinbrink's measurements reveal that the angle of ascent in the shaft fluctuates between 33.3 degrees and 40.1 degrees over a distance of 17 meters. Block number 4 appears to mark a significant point where the angle was intentionally altered. To achieve this, the builders even cut the shaft 2 centimeters deep into the beginning of the floor block. The significant variations in shaft angle and the changes made to block number 4 suggest that the ancient Egyptians encountered a conflict with the construction of the Great Gallery, which was ongoing simultaneously. As a result, they were unable to adhere precisely to the originally intended shaft angle. Gantenbrink also noted signs of minor settling in blocks number 2, 3, and 4, which could be attributed to the pressure from the ceiling beams. At the beginning of block number 7, 
He reports the end of a threaded iron rod, as shown in this image. He comments, since no scholar has reported investigating the shaft using such a rod, we can assume it is an artifact of an unsuccessful treasure hunt that was supposed to remain secret. At the end of block number 9, the shaft takes a turn of about 45 degrees to the west in order to avoid the solid structure of the Grand Gallery. It was at this point that Dixon's iron rod became stuck when it encountered the bend. Unable to retrieve it, he seemed to have given up his shaft probing and instead unscrewed the lower section of the rod, preventing it from protruding out of the shaft entrance. In this shaft section where the angle changes towards the west, there's a square rod lying on the floor of the shaft, extending towards the east wall. In 1993, UPO2, the robot exploring the shaft, was not equipped to navigate the abrupt westward turn in the shaft. Despite this limitation, the robot's camera allowed researchers to obtain an initial glimpse of the ongoing portion of the shaft. Ganton Brink reported finding two rods in the shaft, a hexagonal threaded rod, and a square rod, each measuring 2.7 meters in length. In Ganton Brink's image, he labeled the hexagonal rod as Dixon's rod, and noted that the square rod had a fractured end. While some refer to these rods as being left by Dixon, there is no clear evidence in the literature at the time to suggest that Dixon inserted these rods into the shaft. A more detailed account of inserting rods into the shaft is provided by Morton Edgar. He ordered several long steel rods, ranging from 13 to 16 feet in length, and had them threaded at each end with screw couplers to allow them to be connected together into one continuous length. Edgar attached a wooden ball to the end of one of the rods to prevent it from getting stuck in joints or rough masonry. He began by probing the north air shaft of the Queen's chamber, pushing in the rod with the wooden ball first and then coupling additional rods as needed. The rods were made of flexible steel because the channel in the north side of the Queen's chamber does not follow a straight, upward path but curves around to the west to navigate around the masonry of the Grand Gallery. The north air channel of the King's Chamber also bends around the masonry of the Grand Gallery on the west side. This flexibility allowed the rods to navigate these curved sections of the shaft. The mystery surrounding these rods and their origins may have been solved through the work of the National Geographic team and their Pyramid Rover. Their rover successfully navigated the bend in the shaft that had previously halted Ganton Brink's exploration. After multiple attempts, it reached a length of 209 feet at the end of the shaft where they discovered a closure stone similar to the one sealing the southern shaft. In their report, they provided the following information. 1. Two metallic rods run along the floor of the air shaft for a significant portion of its length. 2. The first rod becomes visible at around 25 feet into the shaft, while the second one appears at approximately 60 feet, just before the first bend to the left. 3. The first rod is hexagonal in shape with threaded connecting sections, whereas the second rod is thinner and has four sides with matching threaded connection sections. 4. Both rods share a similar appearance, but further analysis is needed to understand their relationship and the sequence in which they were inserted and possibly abandoned. 5. At the 85-foot mark, one of the rods terminates with what appears to be a wooden ball at its end. This new information sheds light on the presence of these rods within the shaft and opens up avenues for further investigation regarding their purpose and the circumstances surrounding their placement and abandonment. In the first phase of the investigation, the team's robot successfully ascended to a height of approximately 90 feet inside the shaft. In the second phase, they managed to reach the end of the shaft. During these phases, they made the following observations. 1. The two metal rods, which had been mentioned previously, remained in place within the shaft. 1. The rods had been slightly moved during the first phase of the investigation. 2. At an elevation of 84 feet, the team spotted a knob on the end of the smaller iron rod. 3. At an elevation of 119 feet, they encountered the end of the second rod, which also featured a knob attached to its end. These findings indicate that the two metal rods remained in position inside the shaft and had been shifted slightly between the two investigation phases. The report indicates that both the square and hexagonal rods found in the shaft had knobs on their ends. This observation strongly suggests that both of these rods are the remnants of Morton Edgar's rods. Edgar had mentioned that he fitted wooden knobs to the ends of his rods for his probing attempts. 
Furthermore, both of his attempts to explore the shaft were unsuccessful, resulting in the rods breaking. It's worth noting that the two rods in the shaft may have been different from each other, with one being square and the other hexagonal, potentially due to Edgar using different types of rods for his separate attempts. The northern shaft in the Queen's Chamber follows a twisting path with multiple bends along its length. According to the National Geographic team's observations, as the shaft extends from the Queen's Chamber, it initially heads north. After about 60 feet, it makes a sharp left turn at an angle of approximately 45 degrees. Then, at 76 feet and 84 feet, the shaft takes two consecutive right turns at an angle of roughly 20 degrees each. Around the 84-foot mark, it turns right again at a similar angle. Finally, at 96 feet, the shaft makes a slight bend to the left. These sharp bends and turns characterize the intricate path of the shaft. Many theories have emerged regarding whether these small shafts were designed to align with specific stars or constellations. However, due to their bending nature and relatively small dimensions, it's challenging to pinpoint their exact alignment with celestial objects. These shafts are often depicted in two-dimensional vertical cross-section diagrams, which can be misleading since they do not accurately represent the winding and irregular paths these shafts actually follow within the pyramid. The lack of detailed data from the north shaft is unfortunate. However, the placement of the Queen's Chamber at the midpoint of the pyramid strongly suggests that the shafts were originally intended to be symmetrical. It appears that modifications were made to the construction of the north shaft to navigate around the obstacles posed by the Grand Gallery. The Grand Gallery's masonry consisted of a significant depth of high-quality stone, similar to the breach in the Queen's Chamber niche, which the shaft had to circumvent. This would have presented a significant challenge for the pyramid's builders. There are differing opinions and theories regarding the design and purpose of these shafts. One theory suggests that the angle of the Queen's shafts was intentionally set at an angle of 1114, which would allow them to intersect the pyramid face at a 90-degree angle. This design would result in an angle of approximately 38 degrees, similar to Gantenbrink's measurement for the south shaft, approximately 39 degrees. Another theory, proposed by Legan, relates the Queen's shafts to a similar geometric construction as the King's shafts. He suggests that the Queen's north shaft was directed at the same focal point as the King's north shaft, resulting in an angle of 1417 or about 39 degrees. Assuming symmetry, this theory implies that both the north and south shafts would have opened on the 90th course of the pyramid. These examples demonstrate the challenges in interpreting the architect's intentions and the purpose of these shafts. Different theories and angles have been proposed, but the exact design idea behind the Queen's shafts remains a subject of debate and uncertainty. The pent ceiling in the Queen's chamber is a unique feature within pyramids, as previous solutions typically involved corbelled ceilings. For instance, the upper chamber in the Red Pyramid, which is slightly narrower than the Queen's chamber, has an impressively high corbelled ceiling. If the same solution was used in the Queen's Chamber, it would result in an even taller ceiling. However, the architects chose to introduce the pent beams in the Queen's Chamber. One possible reason for this innovation is that the architect aimed for a more unified design throughout Khufu's pyramid. They might have wanted to avoid having an exceptionally tall corbelled ceiling under the Grand Gallery, which could disrupt the aesthetic and structural harmony of the pyramid. There may also be symbolic reasons behind this choice, such as emphasizing the unusually thick 35th course of stones, which represents one-fifth the height of the pyramid. This choice may have had deeper meaning, possibly related to specific measurements or proportions within the pyramid's design. One can speculate endlessly about the architect's intentions based on available data, but the truth is that our understanding of the pyramid's interior remains incomplete and inconsistent. Sir Flinders Petrie's work still serves as the primary reference point for the pyramid's interior measurements. While the exterior of the structure has been measured extensively, the accuracy of Petrie's and Piazzi Smythe's work inside the pyramid is uncertain. Petrie even incorporated some of Piazzi Smythe's values into his work, and certain measurements were never taken. Given the advanced technology available today, such as laser scanning, it is surprising that a modern and comprehensive survey of the pyramid's interior has not been conducted and made public. Such a survey could reveal significant discrepancies in the earlier data and potentially challenge various mathematical models and theories. 
It's essential to recognize that Petrie and Smith conducted their work in the 1800s under challenging conditions and limitations. It's highly likely that they would have welcomed the opportunity to have their work re-evaluated with modern, more accurate methods. The accuracy of our data is critical because any theory must withstand scrutiny based on precise measurements. However, the question remains, do we possess the accurate data needed to truly understand the Great Pyramid? As we come to the end of our exploration into the Queen's Chamber shafts of the Great Pyramid, we find ourselves with more questions than answers. The enigma of these concealed passageways continues to captivate the imagination of researchers and enthusiasts alike. While the precise purpose of these shafts remains a subject of debate, the discoveries made by early explorers, as well as the insights gained from modern robotic missions, shed light on the remarkable craftsmanship and intricate design of the ancient Egyptians. The copper fittings, the sealed stone at the end of the shaft, and the tantalizing mason's marks and hieratic numerals all contribute to the mystique of these passages. The various theories about their function, from ventilation to possible astronomical alignments, highlight the complexity of the Great Pyramid's design and the multidimensional thinking of its builders. The measurements and interpretations of these shafts, whether it be 121 cubits or another dimension, leave room for ongoing research and investigation. In the end, the Queen's Chamber shafts remind us of the enduring mysteries of the ancient world and the boundless curiosity of humanity. As we continue to explore, question, and seek answers, we embark on a journey that connects us with the remarkable ingenuity and wisdom of those who came before us. We hope you have enjoyed this deep dive into the mysteries of the Great Pyramid's Queen's Chamber shafts. Stay curious, keep exploring, and never stop seeking the secrets of our shared human history. Thank you for joining us on this intriguing adventure.